Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Dr. Kofelt, and we're talking about solubility oils in this part. So, we mentioned earlier that solubility is how much something dissolves in a solution. In, in this case, we've been talking about aqueous solutions. So, an insoluble solid product that separates from the solution is called a precipitate. Okay, a precipitate. It precipitates. You may have heard people call rain precipitation. Okay, same thing. The water is falling out of the clouds, so it's precipitating. The chemical reaction in which a precipitate, the solid, forms is called a precipitation reaction. And they usually involve ionic compounds, but a precipitate does not form every time two solutions of electrolytes are combined. Whether or not a precipitate forms depends on the solubility of the products. So a lot of times you're gonna start with the reagents or reactants that are soluble, both aqueous solutions, but then when you mix them together and they do their swap thing in the reaction like we saw in chapter three, where the anion swaps cations, then one of them may form a solid. And when that solid forms, then a precipitate reaction has occurred. So an example here is that a colorless aqueous solution of sodium iodide is added to a colorless aqueous solution of lead nitrate. So those are both soluble because they're aqueous solutions. A yellow precipitate forms in the form of lead, lead to iodine. Sodium and nitrate ions remain in solution. Okay, and we're gonna see how um, that shows us um, the ionic changes in the solution. So when a substance like sodium chloride dissolves in water, the water molecules remove individual ions from the solid structure itself and surra surrounds them. That process is called hydration, okay? And in old school, we used to call it a sphere of hydration where the water molecules surround uh, atoms and pull them off of that three-dimensional um, structure. Water is a great solvent because it is polar. That is, it is negative on one end and slightly positive on the other end. And if you have something in solution that's positive, it's going to be attracted to that negative end of the water. And if you have something that is negative, like chloride, it's going to be attracted to that slightly positive end. And so that's how this actually happens. So I've got a better picture of it here. So this is your solid matrix here. And so we can, like, we can assume that you've got sodium and chlorines, okay? We'll say the chlorines are the yellow and the sodium are the white. And, the, and this, we know that the sodiums are positively charged. And so when these start surrounding, what you'll see is the water molecules that are in this solution will orient and turn so that the negative end is facing the positive ion. And then conversely, positive ends of the water molecule are gonna face the negative ion. And so they're going to use that force to pull these ions out of that solid matrix. This water is very powerful. So solubility is the maximum amount of solute in that case we were looking at sodium chloride that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a specific temperature. If you change the temperature, you're going to change the solubility, okay? But 
solubility, and usually we do it at room temperature, like 25 degrees C or so. And, it, and, and you have to define that temperature when you define solubility of a compound. But not all ionic compounds dissolve in water, as we mentioned earlier. Here's the kicker. If the ion's attraction to each other is stronger than the ion's attraction to the water molecules, then it will not dissolve. So say if we had a positive and a negative ion as part of an ionic salt, and this attraction here is very strong. It is so strong that this water molecule, this polar water molecule, is not strong enough to pull it away. Okay? It's not strong enough to pull it away. This is too strong. It hangs on too tight then it won't dissolve and it will not be hydrated and form a, a soluble um, solution. So we have some guidelines to kind of help us do predict that. And, and if you're taking a test with me, you will have these guidelines. So learn how to read this chart and make sure you understand what it means. Okay, water soluble compounds are defined as compounds that have alkali metal cations, okay? Alkali metal cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. If you look at your periodic table, you can see what I'm talking about. Or the ammonium ion. On the negative side, nitrates, acetates, and chlorates are going to be soluble. Compounds that have chlorides, bromides, or iodides attached to the positive or sulfate are going to be soluble. Now, the exceptions to that, you're going to see these same players over and over again. We call these the heavy metals. So if it's a chloride, bromide, or iodide, it is soluble unless it's attached to a silver, mercury, or lead. Those are our heavy metals, okay? The sulfates are going to be um, soluble unless they are silver, mercury, lead, or calcium, strontium, or barium, okay? Those are in that group, too. All right, and they're just the rules. That it, it's just something that we put together to kind of help you understand what the what the possibility is that it's going to either form a solid or or an aqueous. Water insoluble compounds are going to be always carbonate, phosphates, chromates or sulfides unless they are with the lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and ammonium that we talked about is always soluble in the first chart, okay? The hydroxide is gonna be insoluble unless it is the lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, or cesium, or barium, okay? So these are insolubles. The first, first chart was solubles, okay? Notice that we classify these by their anions. So we call something that's attached to a chloride ion a chloride. Okay, group one, that first column in the periodic table, and the ammonium cation, silver, mercury, and lead, and then the heavy group twos, which we talked about, um, the Ba2+, plus, calcium 2+, plus, and what was the other one? 
barium, strontium, st strontium, sorry, um, are also going to be exceptions. So you'll see those over and over again. All right, so the best way to do this is to apply it, all right? And so if we look at silver nitrate, okay? All nitrates are soluble, right? So I want to, I hope I don't make you dizzy. I'm going to go back and forth on this. All right, so we've got silver, we've got nitrates that are always soluble, and it doesn't matter what it's attached to. So I know silver nitrate, just like all nitrates, is going to be soluble. Calcium sulfate. Sulfates are also often soluble, but the exception to that is if it is attached to a silver, mercury, lead, calcium, strontium, or barium. And so in this case, calcium sulfate is non-soluble because the sulfate is attached to that calcium, which is the exception to that rule. And then potassium carbonate, you just remember that if it's in group one, okay, which is sodium, potassium, lithium, those guys, it's always soluble, okay? So it's always going to be soluble no matter what it is hooked to. So all I did was I go went back, and it's a good idea. Go ahead and print off the exam resource pages if you are in my class or go back and look at the solu soluble tables that I've provided here to look at that and remember that potassium, sodium, um, lithium, those guys are always soluble. So if you see it in something, you know it's going to be soluble. So you can look at the other uh, compound that might be formed. So... Here are your practice ones to go back and look at your table and see if they're going to be soluble, insoluble, or non-soluble um, or not. And, and so it's important that we can identify these because when we start putting things together in reactions, we've got to figure out which of the products is insoluble. All right, that's it for solubility and figuring it out. Um, now that we know how to um, predict whether our products are going to be soluble or insoluble, in the next part we're going to figure out how to write the molecular equations, the ionic equations, and then the net ionic equation, which tells us what the reaction actually happened and whether or not a precipitation occurred or not.